Hey everyone, my name is Tegan and welcome back to Tandy Writes. Today we're going to be wrapping up my reading for the month of October. This month I've read eight books and when I was originally going to film this video a week or so ago I thought there was no hope I would hit eight books because I was on four. So it's been a very eventful one week. And I will also confess now that one of those books I've claimed to have read is my own because I've been working on edits for my maybe upcoming book for a while when I finished this specific draft this month and dear god I've read that book so many times now I am going to count it towards my reading goal. Okay let's start with some moods. As usual my biggest moods are emotional, tense and dark, a bit of adventurous in there, but this month we have reflective and light-hearted and hopeful and also sads in there and I don't think I've actually had sad come up in a chart for a while. And looking at this like what which book was reflective, like hard and hopeful? I'll work it out soon. On my genres, five out of the eight books are LGBT, half of them are young adult, and two of them are thrillers, horror, contemporary, and there's just a lot of one-off genres in here. So for example, this month I read All That's Left in the World, which is like a dystopian post-apocalyptic queer survival novel. So that covers dystopian science fiction maybe even romance? Maybe romance. I'm not too sure which one of these books is classed as romance. Then my average rating for the month was 3.83 stars, which is actually pretty good. I had to reread one of my favourite books this month via audiobook, and then I had a new favourite which we will talk about soon. And 3.5, the one that's got no rating is my own book, because I refuse to rate my own books. I'll leave a little, a little review talking about it, but I will refuse to rate my own books. And also I will not rate like my friends' books, I will leave them a lovely, a lovely gushing glowing review but I'm not going to give you a star rating. That just feels too personal, you know. Okay, let's talk about some books. Actually first let's talk about some formats. I've read no physical books this month, I've read four library ebooks and I've had three audiobooks and then I've had my one word document book. I also purchased two more books, Mortarstones on a buy one get one half price offer, so my physical TBR is ever growing as always. We're not going to talk about it. And I will also say that I've applied for a job as a Christmas temp at Waterstones, and even temps get the 50% off all books. So once again, we will see how this goes. Okay, so the first book I finished reading this month was Tripping Arcadia by Kate McQuist. And this is a book I think I've had on my, on my TBR for a while. I must have seen it years and years ago, because Paper Fury does like very beautiful flat lays on their Instagram, and I must have saw the book cover and thought, I'm just going to add every single one of these flowery girl book covers to my TBR. So this one has been on my TBR for I think years. No idea what it was about until now. And looking back I still can't really tell you. I remember I enjoyed it. It's kind of about a girl who's becoming the assistant to a rich family's doctor. She realises that the rich family is absolutely nightmarish and in her spare time she makes poison. And I think I did enjoy this book. It took me a bit of time to get into it, and I read a lot of it sat on a National Express coach expressing myself nationally. So I think that like, the bus fumes kind of gave me a fever dream vibe at some point. But like, I enjoyed it. But what happened? I think I gave it three stars. Was it a 2.5 three stars? Was it a natural three stars? There's just something off about it. I think maybe overall I just didn't understand the character's intentions. I think... I was supposed to believe the characters were a lot closer than they were when these interactions didn't happen on page. I just wasn't getting, so there's something, it was supposed to be about the characters, there's something that wasn't right for me. But I enjoyed the vibes. The next book I finished reading this month was I Hideous Progeny by C. McGill, and this is a new entry into my favourite books of all time, and I'll have a review coming for this in the next few weeks because I am obsessed with it. 4.5 stars. So this book is a literary revisiting of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and it's queer and it's got a provocative twist and it's promoted as perfect for readers of Circe and Ariadne. I have read Circe, I have not read Ariadne, even if it's probably somewhere on these shelves, but good comparison, good comparison. So it's Frankenstein, but if Victor was an experimental female paleontologist in the Victorian times, and if he decided to try a very literal fossil reconstruction rather than build a body from scratch. It's this story of ambition and obsession and forbidden love and sabotage and adventure and it blends this very classic immersive storytelling with contemporary themes. And I can't wait to talk about this book in more detail because I'm going to film that video directly after this one. 
But yeah, this book was wonderful. Again, quite slow to get into, but when it hit, it hit. Next up, I have two audiobook rereads. The first one is These Violent Delights by Mike and Emma Rever, which I don't know if I've ever done a full review for, but it's again a book I saw because Paper Free was obsessed with it, and I blindly trust everything Paper Free says. So I picked up this book. I didn't pick it up. It took me years to find a copy that exists in the UK. And I think an actual UK edition is coming out next year, you know, four or five years after release. So I think I had to like import my copy from somewhere and I fell in love. It's, I think it's this one here. This book is promoted as The Secret History Meets Call Me By Your Name and can't vouch for that comparison because I've not read or seen neither. But it is a story about violence and obsession and intellect and passion and cruelty and it consumed me entirely. So I finished reading it last year? Start of last year. And I thought about it like every single week until I read it again this month, you know, 18 months later. And it's such a messy, beautifully written story. And I am devastated that this author doesn't have any other books released at this moment. Like it's been four or five years since release. Please give me another one. Next audiobook we read, we have A Siren by Angie Sage. This is part of me rereading the Septimus Heat books because they define my childhood. And I always say that Magic is definitely, Magic the first book is definitely the best one. Flight is a very good second book and, you know, second in the ranking. The third and fourth are fun because they start introducing different locations and different themes. And the fifth book, Siren, again had different locations and different themes, but it feels so much darker than the first four that I reread it by the audiobook and I forgot how much I loved this book. Most of it takes place on like an island, there's a lighthouse there, they're kind of stranded, there's like sirens and ghosts and stuff. And it's such a me book that I think it must have such a defining part of my childhood that I now have a lighthouse obsession. And there's like not a huge amount for me to say, but oh, it's such a, it's a wonderful book. And I'm gonna have to read the sixth one soon. The sixth one's called Dark. It's right down here on the bottom of my shelves. And that's a book I can't remember anything about. So I'm interested to see how it goes. Next up, I read All That's Left in the World by Eric J. Brown. And again, a book I've had on my TBR for a while now. Finally got round to reading. I enjoyed it. I think I put off reading this book for so long. I think it's only been out for two years, but I saw it when it came out and it came out during COVID and it is about a, you know, post-COVID-esque pandemic that has destroyed the world. So I thought, you know, too soon, too soon. And then I read it and I thought it was going to be like entirely fictional, but no, COVID is mentioned on page, but COVID is not the virus that killed the world. I think bird flu is in this book. So yeah, this book is about a teenager whose entire family's died, so he's left to live um, fend for himself in the apocalypse. He stumbles upon this house because he's injured and he thinks it's empty, but it's not. And here he meets a boy who he like immediately falls in love with. And then they go out and they... I was going to say they try and save the world together, that's not how it works. They team up and they think they're going to set off on this journey to find other survivors. And those survivors will maybe save the world. And yeah, this book is a very solid addition to the post-apocalyptic kind of dystopian stories, especially in terms of queer ones. And I in, I enjoyed it. I think I gave it three stars because like, yeah, it's a solid story. There's not much I didn't like. I liked most of it, but just wasn't entirely for me because I have such a very niche taste in books. There's a little bit of romance in it, but it's so slow burn, it was almost painful, that this book is more of like a platonic adventure with anxiety and questioning and pining rather than like an actual romance. And I think the ending was a bit abrupt for me. At some point in their two characters' journey, they are joined by a third character who they meet in a settlement, and I want to know so much more about this third character. I would love a spin-off of just her perspective. I think Kara is wonderful. Yeah, I think this book was like a very great start to a series, but as a standalone, I think it was kind of like lacking a bit of depth and detail that I would have really loved. Um, next up, we have my book that I wrote, which we are not going to talk about, but I have a video, I think I pre-recorded something that's coming out this month talking about it in detail, but there is a playlist somewhere on this channel called There Will Be Other Summers, and that's why I talk about this book in a lot more detail. Next, I read Hold Still by Nina LaCour, and that's because I'm starting to try and find comparative titles to the aforementioned book I'm writing. Hold Still, it came out in 2009, so it's too old to be a comp title, they need to come out in the past five years, but I know Nina LaCour's books in general 
I'm pretty sure We Are Okay is going to be the fit for me. But I think her writing and themes and writing style is what I'm going to be comparing to. So I read Hold Still because that is the first one she wrote, and I thought, you know, let's start at the start. I have time, let's start at the start. And this book, I liked it. It was quite simple. It's talking about a character whose friend has died before the start of the story, and it's about how she come, um, comes to terms with coping with that grief and that loss. So ultimately, a theme I'm exploring a lot. But I think there's something about these very simple contemporaries that I love, where it's basically characters having a conversation, then they go to another place and they have a conversation, then they go somewhere else and they have a conversation. They're kind of limited on plot, purely character-driven, and I love those so much. But I see this book, I think I gave this book three stars. It was fine, it was okay, I liked it, and it definitely works for what I wanted it. It does what I wanted it to. Especially from the era of, like, The Fault in Our Stars and All the Bright Places, those kind of, like, sad contemporaries. But what really hit me was the author's note at the end. Because I finished reading the last chapter of this book when I was waiting at the train station. And I finished it and I thought, you know, the little there's some quotes at the end that I feel very reminiscent of my own work. So, you know, I kept reading, I read the author's note. And there's one specific line mentioned in the author's note. That where the author explains the reason why she wrote this book. And it is almost the exact same reason why I'm writing my own book. And I was just there, like, on the verge of tears at the train station. Like, it all just suddenly made sense to me. So yeah, like, three-star book, five-star author's note. <laughs> and the final book I read this month was my reread via audiobook of Gallant by the Schwab, which I think is the most polarising <laughs> Schwab book. Because I think a lot of people go with three stars. So you either love it or you hate it. Because again, it's very simplistic. It's purely atmospheric and character-driven. There's not much in the way of plot or suspense or anything really and it's very different tone wise and stylistically from her other novels but Gallant's a kind of book that I am the number one fan of Gallant it's five stars in my heart because it hits so many of my niche interests but I acknowledge it's probably like a 3.5 star read and I do have a full review of Gallant on this channel somewhere so I'm not gonna again go into it now but Five stars in my heart, three stars in reality. I am the number one, if not sole fan of Gallant by V. Schwab. Okay, so those are all the books I read this month. And I'm very proud of myself for hitting eight, even if one of those is a slight scam because it was my own book. So I thought I was going to read four, and even four's okay because my original reading goal at the start of the year is always 52 books because one book, that's one book per week, which is very attainable with my lifestyle. So I thought, even if I read four books this month, that's still on target. And then I look at my actual reading challenge, and I see that I have since increased my reading goal and hit it, and I'm probably going to increase it again. Because I just have far too much free time right now. So yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know in the comments below if you've read any of these books and what your favourite read of the month is so far. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye!